Good afternoon, family. I am praying that you are all doing absolutely awesome today. I, I know that we are supposed to be social distancing, but it's my hope that y'all are able to at least sit on your back porches or front porches or balconies. I hope that you cracked open a window or open the blinds and just taken. We've had some uh, beautiful, beautiful weather uh, these last few days. Just wanted to let you know that I miss all of you. Uh, my prayers have been with each of y'all. I thank God for your prayers on behalf of Kelsey, myself, Indy. Thank you so much. Uh, today, I wanted to share Share some thoughts with y'all. Uh, a verse that, that my heart uh, keeps going back to during this particular period that we're living in. Uh, one that I'm sure most of us are familiar with. It's Paul writing in Romans 8 and verse 28. He says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Now, oftentimes, oftentimes this verse comes up in the discussion of providence. And that's the idea that comes to the forefront of this verse, what Paul is talking about in Romans 8, 28, God's providence. We talk about God's providence a lot as Christians. And before we see the idea presented by Paul in Romans 8, and verse 28, we have to ask the question, what does God's providence mean? God's providence is, well, God providing. Uh, it's the activity of God as accomplished through his will. The word itself comes, the word providence itself comes from Latin origins, which signifies foresight to see beforehand. You see, God's providence as the creator since the beginning, everywhere, has been everywhere and in every place. In Genesis chapter 1 and, verse, and chapter 2, in all the days of creation, God designed a universe with order that would be sustained by his love and care to all of mankind. Uh, Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 45 that God makes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. There's an extension of God's providence, his providing care that blesses not only the believer, but as well as the unbeliever. You know, Paul in Acts chapter 14 and verse 17, he said, he's speaking to pagans there in Lystra, non-believers, and he even told them that God gave them rains from heaven and fruitful seasons. You also see God's providence used to fulfill his redemptive will in the lives of people. Take Ruth and Boaz, for example, in keeping the family line that or keeping the family line that would bring Jesus. Esther, in saving the Jews from annihilation so the Messiah would come. God used Abraham's family to bless all nations according to his will, as we find in Genesis chapter 12. Joseph himself, or Joseph himself, would even acknowledge that God worked in the lives of him and even his wicked brothers, preserving them in the midst of a famine according to his will. Uh, that's what Genesis chapter 15 and verse 20 uh, tells us. If Joseph's brothers would have never, let's take them for example, if they never would have sold him into slavery, Joseph would have never rose to prominence in Egypt and be able to provide for his family during the famine. And, and thus, where would the nation of Israel be? Then there's also God working in the lives of each of his children. Uh, each of his children whom he promises things, he doesn't promise everyone else. You can take that from Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. So now taking what we just discussed about providence, let's go ahead and zoom back into Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. In the ESV translation, which I study from, Paul begins this verse with, and we know. Let's go ahead and stop with that first part, and we know. Uh, Paul begins this phrase with assurance and confidence. Uh, can we be confident that God is working in our lives? According to Paul, absolutely. All of us who are Christians, all of us, we believe God's been working in our lives. And where we're at presently in our lives is because of God. But before moving any further, there is some caution that we have to exercise when it comes to this, when it comes to the study of providence. Because a lot of people tend to attribute things to God's providence uh, that shouldn't be. Things that are against his nature, things that are against his characteristics, things that are against his will. Providence is an amazing study. It's a beautiful study, but no matter how much we learn about God's providence, we will never fully understand it. And so we've got to under exercise caution when we talk about it. Paul, inspired by God, even exercised caution when attributing claims to God's providence. Uh, if you look, uh, Paul was inspired when he wrote the book of Philemon, which is a letter addressed to a brother named Philemon in Christ, whose slave Onesimus ran away. Now, Onesimus, he met Paul, uh, became a Christian, and Paul writes to Philemon to welcome him back as a brother. Now, Paul would say in Philemon, verse 15, he says, For this perhaps, notice the emphasis in the word perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever. Paul believes that perhaps this was God's will, that Onesimus would meet with Paul, become a Christian, so that he can come back as a brother to Philemon. But notice, he still uses that word perhaps. This is Paul exercising caution when discussing things pertaining uh, to God's providence. 
I heard a preacher explain our approach when it comes to talking about providence this way. He said, we might not know for certain what God has done for each of us in our lives as to what it pertains in his overall will, but we certainly can know God has been working. We may not be able to say in every which way in our lives God has worked, but we have the blessed assurance and the confidence that we can know he works. Let's go ahead and keep looking at Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. So he says, and we know all things. We can be confident in God's providence. There's no doubt about that. But now Paul says in all things. What, what all does that entail? We know that God can work even in the most mundane things in our lives, but in the context of Romans chapter 8, and verse 28, what is he talking about? What is the all things in reference to? A lot of times we pick a verse out of a chapter that we like a lot. A verse that, that really that, that motivates us and we sometimes attribute it in ways that it wasn't intended to be used. We overlook the overall context of the chapter. Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 isn't an isolated verse. It has a surrounding context. He's continuing, Paul that is, is continuing an idea that was being built in previous verses. Let's go ahead and look back at the beginning of this context in Romans chapter 8 and verse 18. This is what Paul says in that verse. He says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. If you like to mark your Bibles, I love marking up my Bible, I would make a little note showing this is the all things Paul is referencing in verse 28. Everything in between verse 18 as well as in verse 28 is Paul trying to remind the church that even in the midst of a broken and sin-filled world that throws suffering and pain, there is hope. Our hope and our confidence is that Jesus is going to return and that everything that was lost because of the fall of Adam, reconciliation and peace with God and dwelling in a surrounding of peace will be restored more because of Jesus. If you even look after verse 28, you see that he continues with this idea. Verse 31, he says, what shall we say to these things? If God before us, who could be against us? What things are you talking about there, Paul? Then you look at verse 35 through verse 37. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So what are all the things, all things Paul references in verse 28, verse 31, and verse 37? The sufferings of this present time. Because when Jesus returns, there will be no more death, there will be no more sin, no more sorrow, no more tears, pain. The trials we face in our lives to those who love him, Paul says God works them together. But how? Paul says he works them together for good. Let's go ahead and look back at Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. He says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. God is good. Every good and every perfect gift comes down from above and comes from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. James chapter 1 and verse 17. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. First Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 34. The Jews, after returning from exile in the days of Zerubbabel, sang praises and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, He is good and his mercy endures forever. Ezra 3 and verse 11. Jesus would even say in Mark chapter 10 and verse 18, no one is good except God alone. In other words, he is the very definition and source of good. So God, being the very source of good, can even take situations that aren't good in and of themselves and use them for good according to his will. In Romans 8 and verse 28, in what way can God take the suffering and trials his people go through and use them for good? What is the result of all things working together for good? Let's go ahead and read Romans 8 and verse 29 through 30. He says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Suffering leads to what? According to Paul, it leads to glory. Not only the glory we dwell in in this life, but the future glory Paul referenced back in verse 18. It's ours and will be ours when Jesus returns. God can use suffering and trials to help us become something far more valuable. Peter would say that in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 7. He says the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ, i.e. The, the second coming. Trials help us to become everything God desires for us to be. 
What he's desired for us before Adam fell and we followed suit. Suffering, if we use it properly, can mold us. James would open this letter to the early church in James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4 by saying, Count it all joy, brothers, when you meet trials of various kind, knowing that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect or complete, lacking in nothing. Paul would say to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 17, he says, For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. The sufferings of this present life, God can use them to strengthen us and help us be shaped into the image of his Son and obtain heavenly glory. That's his promise. But, but who does all things work together for good? In my translations, it says in the very beginning, that it's for those who love God, and it ends with for those who are called according to his purpose. James will remind us in James chapter 1 and verse 12, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who what? Who love him. Paul in first and second Timothy chapter four and verse eight would say that the crown of righteousness would be given not only to him, but also to all those who loved Jesus' appearing. So obviously, this promise in Romans chapter eight and verse 28, it isn't for everyone, but for a specific group of individuals. Who are those who love God? Jesus says in John 14 and verse 15, those who love him are those who keep his commandments. Those who follow God, the obedient, those who obeyed what? The gospel, Christians. Those who are called according to his purpose are those who have answered the gospel call. Suffering befalls both the just and the unjust, the righteous and the unrighteous. But the only people that it works for good are those who are Christians. So if we want these things to work out for us, then we need to be the called out and live according to that call. And Paul would remind the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1, he says, I therefore a prisoner for the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. God is working. We can know that assuredly that God is working and he's working in the lives of his children. And we may not fully understand why the things that are happening around us are going on or how God in intricate detail will providentially use them in our lives. But we do know he uses them for good according to his will that we may overcome and be transformed in glory. That is his promise. That is our hope. And no matter what suffering this world throws at us, if we endure, we can assuredly know that the trials, the suffering, the worries, the fears, they all can be used to strengthen and shape us into God's plan. But that promise is only to those who follow him, who obey his will, to those who love him. There's a lot of pain in this world. There's a lot of suffering going on right now, a lot of worry. Do you want it all to be worth enduring? Follow God. Because apart from God, all things don't work together for good. Apart from God, there is no good. Good only comes from God above. And so, my, uh, to, to conclude uh, this idea, this thought that we find here in Romans chapter 8, and verse 28, you and I as Christians, if you're a Christian, you have that hope. But keep pressing forward. Keep fixing your eyes on Jesus as the Hebrews writer reminds us in Hebrews chapter 12. The author and finisher of our faith, it's in him that we have hope and assurance. Knowing that the things that are going on in this lifetime right now, the things that we see on the news, the things that we've heard maybe on the radio and our cars as we're driving to our jobs, uh, those of us who are still working mobily, though, or rather those of us who are still traveling to our jobs right now, those of us who are working in, in the medical field or in the service industry, know that all these things, if you're in Christ, all these things that you may be going through this time, maybe it be fear, maybe it be worry, maybe it be concern, all those things eventually are going to show that they're worth it. They're worth enduring. That God can use those things to strengthen us and help us be transformed and ready for the day that his son returns. And that day can come tomorrow. That day can happen tonight. Let me tell you, I don't know about you, but I am getting absolutely tired and exhausted of the news. And the news is great, it informs us in a lot of things, but too much of it is just too much for one person, right? And too, of it, too much of it is too much for people uh, to talk about with their families, and too much of it, let's focus on the good news. Let's spend most of our time focusing on the good news, not just, you know, the proper way to wash our hands, or, or when we take in our groceries, should we, do, should we do this, should we put them here, should we, how should we handle this? Those things are important, but the most important thing that we can do within this lifetime is focus on the news that Jesus Christ because of what he's done has given to us.
And because of that good news, the hope that we can have, that we can press on and endure, and that there is future glory that awaits for us that is far greater than anything this world can throw at us. Let me tell you, before all this, I didn't even know how to spell coronavirus. I didn't even know what a COVID-19 was. Let me tell you something. Uh, it doesn't matter what big word or scientific word or anything this world can throw our way. Uh, honestly, God is far greater. God is far greater. And we are sustained. And there are several smaller words that have powerful impact in our life, like hope, like love, like faith, like truth. We have those things and we can keep pressing on because of what he's done for us. I love you all. Uh, God bless you. If there's anything I could do for you at this time, I pray that y'all are having a good evening. And if there's something that I can do for you tonight in prayer, or, or if you if you need to talk to somebody, please let me know. Um, right now, there's a lot of things going on. All of us are, are busy with different things. A lot of us, you know, have different, we're going different directions. Let's stay in contact. Let's stay in touch with each other. Let me know if there's anything I could do for you and I can pray about and keep us in prayer as well. Keep me and my family in prayer. We love you all. We pray that all this be done soon. All, everything that's going on right now be over soon. Uh, we know that when it is, man, that Sunday, that Wednesday, whenever it's going to be that we see each other again as a family together in the same room, oh man, that's going to be an awesome day. But we know that regardless of whatever reunion we have in this lifetime, it is nothing in comparison to the reunion we're going to have in eternity. Praise God. I love you all. God bless you.